one of the things that was recognized here is that the seeing of this did sort of destroy a lot of kind of spiritual, I'll call them preconceptions, like, for example, to be still and silent. I had to go to a special still and silent holy place, which might be a monastery halfway up a mountain or something like that, where I could meditate. And when this was seen, it just became... That thought just became ridiculous because, you know, this could stand in the middle of London, in the busiest um, part of London with traffic whizzing around and the recognition that there was just as much stillness and silence in the traffic whizzing around Trafalgar Square in London as there might be in the most profound state of meditation in a Buddhist monastery halfway up a mountain. That's profoundly shocking to recognize that. Welcome to Letting Go and the Greatest Secret, where we explore the end of your suffering and the beginning of lasting happiness. I'm Hale Dwaskin, and today I'll be joined by Richard Sylvester and Dawn Garland. Richard Sylvester has been holding meetings about non-duality in Britain and other countries since 2005. He has written four books, including I Hope You Die Soon, and his latest, Confessions of a Seeker, about his 30 years of seeking. Dawn Gowen awoke to deep, abiding, boundless love in 2012. She's a non-dual speaker with an interest in integration issues and energetic experiences, including Kundalini phenomenon. Dawn holds non-duality meetings in London and has co-hosted meetings with Richard Sylvester on Nothing Media. Dawn is also a transpersonal integrative psychotherapist. Can you start by just telling us a little bit about the the history before the recognition that there was no person, no separate individual? And either one of you can start. Me too. Um, yeah, you go ahead. Okay. So mine was really a history of suicidal depression, which was quite intense. Um, I always find life very, very difficult. So I was very much caught up in my mind 24 seven, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't realize, I mean, there was two, two parts to the awakening. So the, the, the emptiness, which was seen, which kind of gave me a kind of release because I wasn't so frantically desiring as I had been that kind of fell away. But the, the seeing of uh, unconditional love was just stepping into utter silence and peace so which was so radical and yet so simple and so so kind of grounded and ordinary at the same time but it was just stepping into kind of no mind and peace and resting where I am and so yeah it's a quite a radical shift it sounds like it it sounds like it it's beautiful Richard for me um I led a very um, straightforward and ordinary life in a way till I was 30. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, um, I would say that spirituality bit me. I learned to meditate and it had a profound effect on me. And that set me off down a path of spiritual seeking, which lasted for about 30 years. It took in gurus and... um, techniques and Buddhism and all sorts of things, but also quite a lot of um, uh, transpersonal psychotherapy as well. So a mixture of that as well. And that went on very happily and very entertainingly for about 30 years. (laughs) I've written a book about that whole 30 years. It was very colourful. And um, then rather suddenly after 30 years, I came across what, you know, is sometimes called radical non-duality. And that 30 years of seeking kind of stopped just like that. And I was just hooked by radical non-duality. I couldn't tell you why. Uh, I had no real 
understanding of it and the more I tried to understand it the less I succeeded but something about it just grabbed me by the throat and that was that <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean it, it's very yeah. difficult to to think about it it just is so I heard on one of your wonderful recordings about, oh, you shared a little bit about how you met. Would you, either one of you mind, or both of you, uh, mind sharing a little bit about that? Well, I met, so I met Richard, it was after a Tony Parsons meeting. And uh, so, yeah, <laughs> I just, yeah, I just ended up talking and uh uh, I think somebody was accusing me of flirting with Richard and <laughs> and he said, are you flirting with me? And I said, yes, I am. So we kind of, he just kind of laughed and we just kind of, yeah, we ended up going out after that, didn't we? We did. Uh, yeah. So just use the excuse of the meeting because he was sat, sat in his own, weren't you? And at the time. Yeah. So. There's a there's a hangout cafe after Tony Parsons meetings that um, some of us go to and hang out. Yeah, so I was sort of in there as usual, and and it went from there. Yeah, yeah we just had an awful lot in common because we were both our bookcases were very similar. <laughs> we read the same stuff, and uh, yeah, so there's, there was an awful lot in common. Yeah, we both gone from kind of poetry to literature to philosophy to sort of more eastern philosophy to you know this stuff so there's a lot of overlap and mm. that you know except Richard was successful in what he did I, I didn't I wasn't I wasn't I was just, just like yeah, yeah. psychotherapy as well, well was like, that in both our backgrounds yeah, yeah. psychotherapy yeah I, I, I did my training after after the awakening actually so yeah so the first time I saw Dawn's bookshelves, I kind of had a bit of a double take, like, you know, my loss of, I kind of wandered into my own room by mistake because these are actually my bookshelves. So, <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of crossover in all sorts of ways. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, I think if I was still um, back in my seeking days, I would say something like, it was meant to be. Right. <laughs> That's, That's a fun a thing people say. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, but it's it's nice for people to hear that you met and in a in a very normal way and the relationship well, I don't know if anything's normal. In in a way that most people would, uh even though there had already been a recognition. A lot of people have, there are so many misconceptions about what it's like to, to live life without a center or without being a person. And most of what people believe is complete nonsense. And it adds a, a, an unnecessary amount of stress around it and artificial barriers to something that's completely natural so that's part of the reason i asked you to share that because it's it's just beautiful for people to hear this because they believe it's got to be one particular way <laughs> have you noticed that too both of you well got to be one particular way i mean yeah i mean they're different i think there are different depths to it as well because i sort of assumed everybody everybody kind of was in a total no mind state. I thought that 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 was it, but actually a lot of people, they still have mind stuff afterwards. Yes. So I was so empty. Um, I think it took me a long time to talk about it because of that. So, and, and I had doubts at the same time, which which seems really incongruous now, like how, how I could have even had that, but it was, so I didn't really mention it for, for quite a couple of years or whatever, but yeah, it was just absolute, peace yes yes absolutely. but then still still this repetition of patterns in spite of that so that that's what was interesting to me because i didn't see the patterns that were still i was still living out even though i was in this peaceful state you know yes 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 it's interesting there's certainly a lot of stories and i think a lot of misunderstandings generated around this and it's 
pretty difficult to talk about. I quite often get approached by people who um, are saying they're having real difficulties talking to people in their lives about this, like talking to family and yes. friends and so forth. And my reaction is almost always the same. Why would you want to talk to people about this? <laughs> you know, unless you know that they are already um, passionately interested, that their head may be in the tiger's mouth, as uh, Ramana said, why would you want to talk about it? And I'm very wary of that. I mean, I have all sorts of friends who try to tempt me into talking about <laughs> morality, but usually I try to shut these conversations down as fast as possible, because I know it's just going to be stressful for them and stressful for me. And where there is a real genuine, you know, empathy or interest then you know then you know we recognize that and, and then it's yes. delightful yeah so it happens spontaneously then yeah but i find I, any, I, I, yes I, I did find that people i bump into were i i did have a lot of synchronicity where i'd bump into someone like one girl was in, in a library and I, right away there was some sort of energetic sense about her and i realized she was awake and uh, we had a conversation it turned out actually she was, and we, you know, like there was a lot of that in the supermarket and other places. It's like, actually, it was it was very, very unusual, apart from the people who were close to me who didn't get it and didn't want to know. But yeah, in, in normal life, it was like, wow, you know, just constantly came across people who knew where I was coming from. And yeah, it was really odd. Yes. Very nice. Yeah. For me also, the other side of what I just said is for me, there's a tremendous connection with people who are kind of genuinely hooked by this, fascinated by it, which is one of the reasons it's so delightful to go to real in-person meetings and then be able to hang out with people who are on the same page. So it's, it's, it's like I have, you know, I have friends for whom this is a complete blank and there'd be no point in going there at all. And then I also have people I know through this where there's that, you know, that connection which doesn't really exist in any other way. Yeah, oh, no, absolutely. My group, I do something unusual in that I still teach self-help, but from a very expanded perspective. But in my retreats, what I do is I talk from a, 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 a more non-dual perspective. And one of the things that people really miss because of COVID is the, the community around that, to be able to hang out normally and have conversations with people where you don't have to monitor what you say or uh, there's just this natural sense of kinship and openness and community that happens that I know uh, my network is really wanting to go back to, which hopefully we will soon. But it, it also seems as well, there's a there's a sense of being allowed to bring anything to the table when you meet people like that. Like it's it's almost like no moral inhibition, no none of the usual taboos it feels very free and you can be as crazy if you want to be that that you know or I just feel like I can just let let go in that environment and yes it's beautiful and I haven't there's no equivalent environment I've ever been in that's as free as that yes no I well because whether it's it's been completely recognized or at least people have some intellectual understanding of it there's this there's this great sense of acceptance for for whatever the body mind is pre is presenting. It's just mm -hmm. okay as it is, yeah. and that that's, that is just a lot of fun to be around. Yeah, it is it's, yeah. <laughs> a lot of it's, laughter, a lot. Of right, it's, judge, yeah. it's judgment free. Yes, and yes. I think just thinking back to when I first became fascinated with this and started going to um, meetings, I think that was one of the things. It was just sort of like so expansive and such a relief after kind of spending many years on the spiritual path, where sometimes, but not always, sometimes there's quite a lot of moralistic stuff around. It just felt so freeing to be in this atmosphere where, well, there was none of that. It was just yes. none of that. It was just openness, really. Just yes. openness. Yes. And this openness, it it doesn't have anything to do with the words, does it? Because you, mm. you can just feel it. When someone is open, that there's you don't there's just this natural reflection that happens within the body mind. And it's it's 
it's kind of instantaneous, which is which is yeah. just I find it fun. And yeah, it is fun. <laughs> fun, fun and freeing. Yes, very freeing, mm. very freeing. So let's get into how speaking happens through both of you when you talk about this topic. And so I know when you do your Zoom meetings, which are lovely, I highly encourage everyone to go to their Zoom meetings. And they're, of course, they're meeting in-person meetings once they start to happen again. But it, generally it starts with you, with you sharing some sort of message that that happens spontaneously in that moment. It's not something I know is pre-planned. It just, it's a spontaneous occurring out of nothing. So I, let's see what spontaneously occurs out of nothing here. If, if either one of you would like to share, that'd be great, or both of you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um... <laughs> Share about um, sort of share about non-duality itself, yes, yes. like as if as if, as if this was the start of something with maybe someone, people there who are interested but don't really know. Yes, all they know <laughs> is that something's brought them here, and yeah. So I suppose it, it is this thing. Actually, it's a kind of, in a way, it's kind of quite. It's quite a scary thing because I mean, I, I was actually a professional lecturer all my all my professional life. I'm very well used to public speaking, but of course, it was always prepared. Oh yes, yes. And it's it's somehow quite a scary thing over and over again to sit down and know that no matter how much you want to, nothing will come until you open your mouth. And when I open my mouth, I have no idea what the words will be. So that's a very different experience from uh, you know my professional life. But if I was to just start, I let's see what would come. I would perhaps start by trying to say very simply and briefly what the seeing of non-duality is. And the simplest way I could put that is it's seeing that there is no self. It's simply that. It's seeing that there's no person at the center of experience if you like what seems to be personal experience isn't personal it's just experience happening and this is how the word or where the word non-duality is so crucial because the common experience for most of us most of the time is of duality which means two things and what are those two things well the two things are myself my sacred wonderful separate personhood that's one thing and then there's the external world of objects and people and space through which i move and that's you know kind of the natural seems to be the natural way of being that most of us just take for granted it seems obvious i, I may never think about it in these terms but it just seems obvious that there is separation, meaning I am separate from everything else. I exist as a separate person and I move through an external world. And what we're talking about here with non-duality is just the possibility of all of that collapsing, if you like, of seeing through that. And the simple and sudden arising of the recognition that there is no separate self who is moving through an external world. There is just whatever's happening and there's no one at the center of that. And I feel like, yeah, that's probably okay, good enough for starters. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a great place to start. <laughs> I, I just never take for granted that the people in the audience aren't awake because my experience in the in-person meetings is that, that there are quite a few people who are actually already realized and just wanting to be part of that community as well. Yes. And I find the creativity, you know, you really, it comes more alive when the questions come and, you know, that's when you kind of realize what you think more than before, you know? So it's, it's much more fun when the questions start. I think. Oh, yes, yes. I, I'll definitely ask questions, too. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I, I completely understand uh, the, the for decades now, 
I, I, I have zero, when I stand to talk about this topic, I have no idea what my ne next thing that's going to come out. Mm. And decades ago, I learned to trust that. At first, I, it was just very odd that I had no idea. And then after the fact, people would tell me, wow, did you know you said this? And I, oh, the other thing that happened is most of the time I couldn't remember what I just said. Unless I needed to, to discuss it, then it would come. But otherwise, it, there was nothing there. Nothing. <laughs> well, it's, it's good you trust it. I don't know that I do, but usually something comes. <laughs> yes, yes. So something always comes, yeah, mysteriously, even though sometimes the something that comes is silence. Yes. Well, that's okay, yeah. too. Yes, it's silence. I think that, that's another thing that, you know, was so unusual for me when I started to go to meetings of this myself as an audience member, just the kind of stunning lengths of silence that were allowed and how relaxing that was as well. Yes, absolutely. The, the, my original teacher, Lester Levinson, used to feel that that, that was the closest to... Re truth or reality, whatever you want to call it, the, the closest expression is without words. Yeah. Words can't, can't reach that. Absolutely. They come from that, but they can't reach it. Yeah, absolutely. So- Words um, to the entertainment, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the entertainment, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what is your, uh, I'll, I'll ask some questions that often come up and, and we'll see what comes up from that. And one of them is, is there, we talk about it as, as either a falling away of something or a seeing of something, but is there anything that the, the apparent person can do about that? Well, there's nothing you can do to make that happen, obviously because there is no one who can make that happen. Although the, the histories of the one to whom it happened it, it are usually quite a lot of turmoil and grief or depression, or there's some seems to be like, it's almost like as if there's a kind of let go, it cannot, the mind or the ego cannot cope with it anymore. It's almost like, it does seem to be like that in most of the cases. Of the empirical research has been done on it so far yes and and, uh, and that makes sense for me because it was suffering and then you get so many more things thrown at you and suddenly it's it's a different life it's, it's almost like a different life you've just stepped into and i think that's why it's so mysterious because there's no looking back there's no oh my god what's you know it's just ah there's this you know it's a stepping into peace. It's very, yeah. It should be shocking, and it's not. That's the bit I get. I, I that gets me really. It's you know, yeah. That feels so natural. It feels so natural, and and yet, if it was an, if there was someone here to whom that happened then it would be shocking as hell right. and be telling everybody. But there's not even that, that even that's gone. It's, it's just, yeah. And, and there, there's, you're just overflow. I think as well, initially, it's so overflowing. That love is just so overflowing. Yes. Emanating from you. And I was like, yeah, it's amazing. Yes. Yes. I think you know if you have the character of a seeker, which I, I obviously did from the age of 30 onwards, um, it seems absolutely obvious that there must be something that I can do about this. And indeed, I am doing things about it. And the more sincerely I do these, then the further along the path, you know, I will go, which is, again, it's part, it's, it's, this is partly why the seeing of this can be such a shock. I mean, this is part of the shock, you know, to realize that, that none of that, had any bearing, none of that counted. There was never anybody doing any of that. And um, it seems outrageous to the mind. I had, a, I, I have, um, when, when 
when we were doing in person meetings before the COVID, um, I had someone who came to me month after month and he'd been a seeker for many, many years. And one meeting, he just suddenly kind of burst out. It seems so unfair. <laughs> <laughs> because he'd been very determined and very, very um, serious seeker for many, many years. And it does seem so unfair because then, you know, you kind of meet somebody who's never even, you know, never read a book on spirituality, never even heard the word non-duality. And they might just be, I don't know, sitting on a bus one day, coming home from work, and suddenly they're not there. Right. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're absolutely. It does seem grotesquely unfair, but yeah, uh, the, the judgments that the mind makes about this have no bearing at all. It's part of the shock. Right. The, the mind likes to think it has control over something. It's got to have control over something. What have I been talking about for as long as I've noticed talking? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the mind likes to think it has control over something or preferably over everything. Yes, preferably everything. Yeah. <laughs> we, we imagine ourselves little gods or goddesses manipulating everything, yeah. not noticing the ridiculousness of that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that, that, that ridiculousness, when it's noticed, might account for all, quite a few stories where when this is seen, there's a lot of laughter. There's this yes. spontaneous outburst oh, yeah. of laughter, <laughs> laughter at the cosmic joke. It is such a cosmic joke that the one who was always seeking didn't even exist. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still find it uh, tickling. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and um, this, again, it can't really be put into words, but I've heard it described, and I've used those words myself, as everything and nothing. Uh, uh, and, or just this uh how does that get expressed through through you well yeah everything and nothing is there's absolutely nothing here and yet everything's appearing and yet the essence of that is love and it's it's seen and it can be physically seen as well as known and it's just known it's just obvious and uh yeah and that, that changes everything and it never goes away and, and also because it's physically experienced, there's no sense of location and there's no sense of there being any anyone or anything here. In, in this case, there's no nothing here. There's no, so there just is no division. And, and, and that's, that's, it's quite odd, I suppose, viscerally, because, because there's just this lightness of being that's, uh, and it's strange at first because you're so used to experience kind of adding something or something to grasp or, and there's none of that. There's just this moving through life. Like, you know, it's just like pure spirit in a sense. There's nothing. There's just a, you know, just experience. And it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Everything and nothing. Yeah. Sometimes I think quite often what happens is that the seeing of nothing, this is what happened here, is that the seeing of nothing is seen first. Or the seeing of emptiness is seen first. And it's that's kind of here that was experienced as absolutely stunning and shocking, but kind of cold and empty. Mm -hmm. And then it was, you know, later on, there was a, another, a second. I mean, sometimes it happens like this, sometimes it doesn't, there's no rules. But later on here, there was a, another opening in which um, the everything was seen or the fullness of emptiness was seen. And, you know, and it, this has to sound paradoxical. It isn't really, but the mind is bound to say, well, full emptiness, I'm sorry, that's a paradox, that can't be. But it is because, you know, there is just emptiness but the nature of that emptiness is unconditional love and that's the fullness 
Yes. And they're the same, <laughs> uh, you know, in the same way. I mean, I'm not the only one who's put it this way, you know, that um, stillness and movement are the same thing. Yes. And silence and noise are the same. And the seeing of this, I mean, one of the things that was recognized here is that the seeing of this did sort of destroy a lot of kind of spiritual, I'll call them preconceptions, like, for example, to be still and silent. I had to go to a special still and silent holy place, which might be a monastery halfway up a mountain or something like that, where I could meditate. And when this was seen, it just became that thought just became ridiculous because, you know, this could stand in the middle of London, in the busiest um, part of London with traffic whizzing around and the recognition that there was just as much stillness and silence in the traffic whizzing around Trafalgar Square in London as there might be in the most profound state of meditation in a Buddhist monastery halfway up a mountain. That's profoundly shocking to recognize that yes yes I, the first time i ever saw that was 1977 i i was standing in times square in new york city before um before it was gentrified and it was a pretty seedy place i was on the way from and it was at night and you have to keep moving but at the same time there was nothing there was just this peace and stillness and nothingness and the body was moving and it it was that i found very sh it was that was shocking to see that it really was still i think it <laughs> there are there are situations where it seems to be deeper like now i will notice a difference where like where where I, there's a situation where I'm in a, a queue or something like that, where it just sink into that so much more. So there, you know, like, cause it, it does vary within that. Like the, for, for me, somatic states come and go within that sort of drunken states of just bliss or whatever. But yes, so yes. With, within it, but the constriction never comes back, but. Yes. Yes. So there's a very uh, busy yeah. there's a very busy conjunction of roads in the town where I live, and there's a coffee bar on one of the corners there, and I sit in that coffee bar, and look out of the window. And I mean, this is I mean, th I know this is nonsense, but I can't help nevertheless saying it, you know, because this is the experience. I sit in that coffee bar, and it just seems to be a you know for some reason more profound silence and stillness in the busyness of the pedestrians and the buses going past that particular coffee bar uh, yeah <laughs> so um obviously you know i i um you know i don't recommend methods but if anybody really really wanted to force me i'd say come and sit in my coffee bar <laughs> <laughs> you you have to give out the address i don't do that you don't want to be inundated <laughs> i will do it in secret to a few chosen <laughs> okay people. okay okay the secret if all you need to do is sit in this bar and you'll experience what enlightenment is. <laughs> oh, that's adorable. <laughs> but yeah, it, the, the quality of it changes. And in before you have any sense of this, there's also, would you agree with this? This is misconception that, that qua the qualities the the love the overwhelming love or the bliss is uh if it's not there then you haven't gotten it and that's such a misconception wouldn't you agree yeah yeah absolutely because it's nothing to do with that in a sense yes and and how much of that you get is up to, you know like it's some people get a lot more of that and at first it can just be that for a I don't know, for a couple of years. I think that's why people are attracted to sitting on benches and right. just, just just being absorbed in the environment. I mean, yeah, it 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 does and it, it that that calms and it it can deepen and calm and but yeah, it's not it's nothing to do with the seeing and the knowing that you know there's just this oneness. So yeah. I think one of the things people most struggle with about this intellectually 
is that it is all embracing. It includes yes. everything, which means that it includes everything which I find distasteful or worse than distasteful. And one of the things, you know, it's an obvious question to come up at meetings, people say, well, what do you mean by unconditional love? And the thing I usually say there is the difficult word in that phrase is not the word love. Almost everybody has some kind of handle on what love is. The difficult word there is unconditional because unconditional really does mean what it says. It means that it embraces everything and therefore it embraces everything which this the character or the individual might most dislike or might most even hate. Yes. Yeah, so unconditional, you know, it's 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 really, really challenging. However, when it's seen, it's it's seen and it's 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 incontrovertible when it's seen, but to think about it and try to justify to it to the mind, well, it's not challenging, it's impossible. Yes. <laughs> well, how can this be love? And how can that be love? And are you telling me that that's love? Well, unconditional love embraces everything, including that which I most hate. Yes very 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 challenging yes 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 that they're approaching this topic as though it's another intellectual object you can hold on to yeah. doesn't get you very far <laughs> or, or approaching it as if it's a kind of um, personal spiritual task which yes, i try yes. very hard you know, I may be able to, I may be able to conquer my distaste of various things so that I can experience this yeah. unconditional love. No, no, I don't experience this. It's seen when I'm not there. Yes. That, that's the, that is, that is hard. That's one of the hardest things that in the beginning when there's still the story of me, but there's tastes, which is very common where people will, uh, will taste it and then the mind reasserts itself. All of that is on one level, and, and again, please jump in if you disagree with anything I'm saying. Uh, on one level, it is, it is still just part of the story of me. But on, on another level, this coming and going is uh, not really happening. The, even the thoughts as they come back or the the experiences that appear to the mind like they can't, this can't be part of that. Uh, that is that too. It's all that. Yeah. Would you agree with that or how would you describe that? Well, I never had the coming and going. I mean, I did have something like a glimpse 20 years ago. <laughs> and uh, so, but, but I, I, I've never experienced that coming and going. Luckily, it was just. Right. Yeah. But of course, it's, it's always here, of course. But energetically, once it's, you know, established, it's established, you know, so thoughts can appear and, and any state can appear within that. So it's, it's unshakable, but it's always the case. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any state can appear within that. And it doesn't have to do with any particular state of those states. You could say it has to do with all of them or none of them, but right. yeah, anything, anything can appear. Mm -hmm. this, this, it, I mean, I've already mentioned my thir at least 30 years of spiritual seeking. It's pretty challenging to somebody who's got a history of spiritual seeking that deep because it challenges so many preconceptions that I absorbed over that time, particularly to do with goodness and morality and this mind's interpretation of what love might really mean without having any idea what it could be. Right. I wasn't really a seeker, so it wasn't mm. quite that. I mean, I'd heard <clears throat> non-duality, you know, a couple of months prior, so I wasn't massively into it, but I knew obviously when love, I knew it was to do with that, but I didn't, I didn't quite have it all figured out and I didn't care really. So, you know, but. You know, with that, I didn't know with the emptiness because I didn't. I saw emptiness first. That was a year before, and I, I didn't know. And I thought something pathological had happened because there was, how could there be nothing here? No right. one, nothing. <laughs> right. was like, so I was just like, I'll keep my mouth shut about that. Like, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, for me, I remember even 
I mean, even just an initial split, you know, split second seeing of emptiness, what happened after that? Because, you know, I'd read so many books. I'd read lots of Zen books and I'd done all this stuff and so forth. And a, a lot of stuff that really had to been totally puzzling. I could just, this mind couldn't make any sense of it. Suddenly it just went boom, 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 and things suddenly made sense. Even just with that initial tiny opening in which there was no seeing of love whatsoever. It was just cold, empty, and yet somehow remarkably attractive. Yes, yes. And then, you know, this all these puzzling things the, uh, that had been said in Zen, these mysterious sayings that seemed to make no sense, and suddenly they made perfect sense. Uh, and they didn't. Right. You know, up till then, I, I suppose I sort of thought of some of the stuff that I'd come across as it's like it's deliberately obscure deliberately puzzling it's like a test for the mind well you know it's like a koan it's designed to make the the mind collapse and then suddenly oh no it's not it's just a literal description of how reality is when there's no one seeing it just just a literal description you know this thing like you know, I, you know everybody knows you know this way and at first mountains are mountains then mountains are no longer mountains then mountains are mountains again what what the hell are they saying <laughs> i mean i'll sit in a dark room and puzzle over that one for 20 years no it's just a literal description when yes this is yes me. isn't that one of the uh, another place where people get really confused they they think when someone is dis uh, describing this, it's somehow prescriptive, where mm. it's just, descri just descriptive. It, wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah. Comes, well, that's where it turns into something you've got to do, doesn't it, as well? Yes. Or, and trying to emulate that. And yeah, it's... <laughs> I don't know. Um, this is freedom. When we were doing um, some uh, Zoom meetings together before, we called them the Wind of Freedom, uh, which is a, a quotation. I don't know who it's from, but somebody said there's something of the wind of freedom blowing through Advaita. And it is it's, it's absolute freedom, it's freedom from rules, freedom from prescriptions, freedom from you know, moralism. So again, this was one of the things that really struck me when I, you know, first started going to meetings around this. It just felt so free after I had sat through the kind of Buddhist meetings and the guru meetings and, you know, so many prescriptions and so much morality around it all. Yeah. yeah. It's just such a breath of fresh air. Yes, definitely. Another question that comes up for people is, is uh, they think that it's got to be one of these two, free will or predetermination. They don't realize it's neither. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> free will's your... <laughs> free will's <laughs> my <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, because we want a story. It's got to be one yes. or the and, and, and that... that um, preconception it must be one or another of course comes from this sensation the belief the understanding whatever we want to call it that i am a separate person and if i am a separate person then either have i have free will which enables me to navigate something called my life or if i don't have free will i must be subject to something like predestination or perhaps the more intelligent form of predestination you know what the buddhists have karma i must be subject to my past karma and then maybe there's a mixture perhaps i am subject to my karma but i have free will through which i can escape it of course because here i am as an autonomous being it's only when the recognition that there's no autonomous being here is seen that it really makes absolute direct sense that of course you know free will you know it's it's not even a question of saying it does or it doesn't exist it becomes irrelevant through that direct thing now having said that i mean i'm aware that there are many philosophers and um many neuroscientists as well you know who are able very effectively to see through free will who are able to see that free will is an illusion you know, through the mind, you know, intellectually, um, and to understand that completely, but to 
actually for the self to collapse so that it's recognized directly is something very different. I think it would be, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I was just going to add, that it's a very, this is a very challenging thing to say to people. And I mean, I often say, if you want to start a fight in a bar, this is probably the <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. fastest way to go, do it. Just go up to somebody, tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, buddy, did you know you haven't got any free will? Which is, of course, a totally erroneous way of putting it. That's it's right. Like, that's you right. You haven't got any free will. Yeah, right, it's right. You don't exist to have free will. Right, right, no, I was right. going to say there's a danger in that too because people hearing that, then they think, you know, the story doesn't exist, therefore there's nothing I can do, you know, in, this, in the psychological. because So people, you know, there's a lot of spiritual bypass through that, I think, yes. as well, where people are actually stop trying to heal themselves. Get, because... You know, we're, there's intelligence there. If we know what to do, we can actually, you know, we we can do stuff about our predicament as well. You know, if if we know what what is wrong, and you know, because there's the, the repression can survive this, and there's a lot of things that can go on, the patterns that can continue, and yeah. So I, I think it can put people off at looking at their stuff, which I think is a real shame, but because there is so much you can do and uh if you haven't looked at stuff it's going to come up at some point in your life you yes. see life confronts you with some shit that you haven't <laughs> dealt with and, and that happened to me and it's happened to plenty of people i know so yeah i mean life doesn't stop no <laughs> <laughs> well, one phenomenon i've um noticed as a speaker is i've had quite a few people over the years who've I, been training in psychotherapy or thinking of training in psychotherapy i actually are already trained and practicing as psychotherapists and when they come across like this sometimes they have a kind of crisis about it because of what we're talking about here yes and you know they've talked to me about it that somehow they now feel uneasy about that because that's to do with the personal story and you know now we're discounting that and you know, I've always, you know, I mean, my view's always been, you know, that if, you know, if psychotherapy is helpful, do it. If you are a psychotherapist and you feel that's what you want to do, do it. You know, the only, um, I mean, I'm, I, I, I usually try not to give advice of any kind, but I'm prepared to give a piece of advice in this particular case, um, which is the only thing I would say is that to somebody seeking a psychotherapist, if they're awake, or even if they've really got a kind of good handle on this, but certainly if they're awake, it's better if they can find a psychotherapist who's awake, because a psychotherapist who is not awake might psychopathologize them. Oh, totally. <laughs> totally. And yeah, the, 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 if, if, the, if you think you're a person and you hear you have no free will and there's no predetermination, that can become a, an excuse to just um, express your life as pathology or to just deny the, the need to deal with life as it is. Which is perhaps why it's sort of necessary sometimes to really clarify this, that, there, this is, that the communication is absolutely, absolutely not, you are a person who has no free will. Right. <laughs> I mean, to say that is to posit the idea that, you know, you, you know, you exist as a person and you're powerless. That's absolutely not what's being said. Right. That's totally not being said. That's wonderful. There's yes. no person there. So the question of being powerful or being powerless doesn't even arise. Yes. Having free will or not having free will doesn't even arise. Yes. Totally. I was giving a talk a long time ago and somebody was sitting in the front row and I gave my introduction and at the end of it, she looked at me and she said, so what you're saying is it's okay if I go out and murder people in the street? <laughs> no, that, firstly, that's not what I'm saying. And secondly, this happened to be somebody that I knew quite well. And firstly, that's not what I'm saying. And secondly, you look pretty unlikely to be the sort of person that would go and do that. Yes. Yeah. But it's kind of, you know, the mind trying to make sense of this desperately. Yes, definitely. 
Yeah, because the, 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 there's as many expressions of this as there are um, apparent individuals. The, the expression of it is different through, through each apparent individual. It's, it's radically different. Yeah, it depends on what's happened beforehand and and after as well. Because I don't think I don't think I'd even brought the psychological in if it hadn't been for the second Kundalini awakening I'd had three years ago, which kind of showed me my own issues, like patterns that were still arising. And that, which, if if you're awake, I think sometimes you can be lucky enough where just seeing it, you can drop stuff as well and change stuff more quickly it depends what it is but so you may not need to it's like a fast track through through issues sometimes I think if you're awake it may not take you years of psychotherapy maybe to get over something but but it might I mean there's no rules with that either but but also there's a taboo against looking at things after awakening as well as if you know you know (laughs) particularly if you're in real deep peace as well it's like there's no incentive there and then suddenly you hit a brick wall and it's like oh okay so I don't have I don't have whatever the resources to deal with a certain situation and it's like oh god yes yes no the rules could also be a taboo against practices yes a taboo about practices I mean I have a long history of teaching meditation I mean I still teach meditation not very often but occasionally I think meditation is marvelous and yet, you know, sometimes there can be this, oh, well, no, you know, practice, oh, no. Right, right. We've got to keep this pure. <laughs> I, still, yeah. I still like eating fish and chips. I still like meditating. Yeah. I still find benefit from both. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah again, the, the, we, we like to make rules about the way life is supposed to be thereby missing the way it actually is. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't guarantee being authentic either. You know, this, which is something, I think that's why it's good to look at everything, the whole the whole person, the, the psychology, how you live, you know, what you want to do, you know, the whole thing. Because what is the point? You've got this life as well, and it's like, it's about actualizing your potential too i mean it's exciting and if you can't do that you know it seems a real shame because this is you know it's like a second chance it's a rebirth in a sense isn't it and so you can some of those wounds will heal not all of them but a lot of them do particularly when it's to do with the heart because the heart's open now so it's if you've had a lot of um, armoring and defenses they can just go so it's exciting. Yes. So second chance. Yeah. Yes. Mm, definitely. Mm. <laughs> so I'm loving this conversation. I could go on for hours, but um, well, let me ask you, uh, what are some of the places of confusion for people as they dive into this radical non-dual message where they kind of get a little hung up and and how do you respond to that? You don't have to do a lot, just one or two, either one of you or both. Well, in other words, there are recurring questions. Yeah, where well, we, where you can where, where, you, where it's very cute to watch how someone is just like they've tried to fit the the person into the box of this non dual perspective, and it's not working. Well, we've we've touched on some of them already. Um, one is the whole thing about you know free will, and the misinterpretation that somehow what is being said is that you are a powerless person. You know, you are a person, but you don't have this precious thing called free will. And I mean, to challenge free will is to challenge a lot more. It's to challenge well, for a start, everything, everything, everything about morality. Yes, yes. So that's another thing that that that, that um, seems to be very, very challenging about this. Um, I mean, that's one of the first things that comes that, that, that comes to mind. Oh, and the other thing I think that is, I think these are probably the two things. Um, 
I haven't been attacked very often in meetings. You know, I say attacked, I mean verbally, I don't mean yes. physically. <laughs> I haven't been attacked very often in meetings, but when I have and when it's been really ferocious, it's usually been around one of these two things. So free will is one of them. How dare you say that I haven't I haven't got free will yet? Right. The other thing is about practices, practice, because this can be heard. I think carelessly, it can be heard as somehow there is um, advice or recommendation here that practices should not be followed. Absolutely not. No, I mean, if practice arises, if practices arise, they arise. You know, I've already talked about many. So I'd say those are, are two of the biggest stumbling blocks for the mind. How dare you tell me I haven't got free will? And... Um, Oh, so I, I shouldn't practice. I should give up my practices. Well, yeah, give them up if you want to. Give them up if you don't enjoy them or you're not doing, they're not doing any good. But otherwise, you know. I, I think um, people often expect that doubt shouldn't be there. And they, 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 they go through this period of looking for validation through different speakers. And yeah. sometimes you'll get people as well who've, maybe been in a kind of more of a kind of cult situation yes. where they've been, they've been invalidated. They've brought an awakening. They've been invalidated and they've been shamed into silence. So they won't talk about it. And actually they might find out later on, Oh my God, I didn't, I didn't really own that. So it's like at some point, you know, it's, it's difficult, but you've, you've got to come into your own power with that. And, and, and start to own it and start to talk about it, express it in some way because you know you if you're particularly if you're a doormat type you know people pleasers you know it's very easy for you to be knocked and you you're not entitled to say anything good about yourself and you might see this as a good thing to say because initially it does it it can sound quite a big thing to say for some people and then you realize of course it's not so there is this process for some people coming from that position where they try to make themselves small because they don't want to get attacked by well if you're a doormat you probably even want more attracted narcissistic type people so make yourself small sit in the audience don't say I'm awake no one's going to get you for that so yeah there can it can be quite difficult and doubts are can be natural but then once you own it it's like the doubts tend to fall away and they've got no power so yeah, so for some people it's just not natural to own anything good at all. So, yes, yes, I think it's that. Yeah, we kind of also. I don't know if it's the the shadow side of that or just another side of that. I think you know when it cut. If if there's a history of spiritual seeking, so I have sat with spiritual teachers. If spiritual teachers, you know, they they give me practices, they give me advice, they tell me what to do. If I do this, this will get me somewhere, and then you know, I report that this is, that it's not happening. You know, I'm, I'm not being gotten to the place, whatever it may be. Um, the kind of the easiest resort for the spiritual teacher is then to blame me for that, to tell me I'm not doing the practice with enough conviction. I'm not doing it with enough dedication or passion or for long enough, or perhaps I'm the opposite. I'm doing it with too much conviction and I need to let go. But in a way, you know, the, the, the obvious resort for the spiritual teacher is to blame me for the failure of the techniques, whatever it may be. It doesn't matter whether it's self-inquiry or clearing the chakras or whatever. So, uh, you know, that's a kind of, um, you know, it's a, it's a good way in which, you know, I as the spiritual, uh, as the spiritual um, seeker, you know, can enjoy some of my favorite feelings of dejection and despair and depression and you know i'm not good enough yeah yes absolutely absolutely it's almost it's 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 almost implicit in the relationship you know and i've been in that relationship as a follower of a guru you know that you know when i sit there I, no matter how much adoration i may be feeling for my guru, nevertheless, you know, I am obviously, I am placing them on a pedestal and I'm placing myself at their feet. Yes, yes, yes. And that's likely to lead to 
a fairly obvious disaster because you know when when we place ourselves at somebody's feet and look at their feet with a holy look upon our face for long enough it's then quite likely that we'll notice that the feet are made of clay <laughs> and then the next thing we'll do is we will swipe the person off the pedestal which we ourselves have put them on right, right which is right. kind of unfair to them and to us yes, and yes. to ourselves uh, absolutely I had a I, I I used to be a lecturer and I had a colleague who one day said to me, you know, Richard, the trouble with students is they're always at your throat or at your feet. <laughs> I thought this was a, an astonishingly wise thing to say. I thought, well, and the same is true of the spiritual seeker. You know, we're always either at the teacher's feet or at the teacher's throat, one or the other. Yes. Yeah. It's a relief to not be the teacher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what so, are we well we're a group of friends right yeah yeah great so uh if people want to find either one of you um we'll, <laughs> we'll put all this information in the show notes but is there anything you want to share about connecting with books or meetings or websites or any of that kind of stuff well, I have an in-person meeting once a month in London. So that's on Meetup, um, second Friday. It's next Friday. Uh, at, so seven o'clock to nine o'clock in Hampstead. Uh -huh. So yeah, I, I do that. And, uh, I've been doing that for quite, through some of COVID as well. Like <laughs> the brave souls who come along. So yeah great this has been one of the very few in person yeah, no, meetings. Right now, I know. yeah people yeah. are still kind of staying in their homes because of covid but yeah they're coming out to Hampstead for you oh yeah. Great. yeah 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 um oh i'm always pushing my one of my books i've written um far too many books about um non-duality but i'm always pushing can i show it i'm also yeah, i'm always sure. pushing this little book because i'm particularly fond of it it's called confessions of a seeker Yes, yes. And it's my book about those 30 years of spiritual seeking that we've partly been talking about. Yes, yes. And it was such fun, and I'm so fond of the stories and all the That's all the fun. all the mistakes I made. Yeah, it's, I've I've also been told it's very funny. I got yeah, an e <laughs> there you go. I got an email from a um a woman who said she was um reading this on the um tube train one evening and she had to stop because she was laughing so hard that people on the train were looking at her as if she was mad. So. <laughs> right, right, right. So I always like to mention that one. <laughs> okay, cool. So any parting words you have for everybody or, or do you think we're in a good place to stop? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, for me, the party was just, I've just really enjoyed this. You know, I mean, you know, we haven't met before. It's all, there's always that feeling beforehand with someone I haven't met. It's like, you, I don't quite know how it's going to go. And, oh, of course. You know, and what it's going to feel like and so forth. But I mean, I've really enjoyed this. It's felt, you know, it's felt very open. It feels like we've um, covered a lot of ground with no rules, which is great. No, right. I did have you? Oh, yeah, a book was on my on my shelf, so I I recognised your name as well. So I, I uh, yeah. So the Sedona method. So I yes. Have that as well. So yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Likewise, it's not. It's so nice to meet you both. I I've really yeah. enjoyed this a lot, a lot. I have. And, yeah. So when my wife and I are are traveling again to Europe, we'll we'll have to look you up. We can we can go to your coffee shop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we can sit in the window of the famous coffee shop. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Richard Sylvester and Dawn Garland. You can learn more about Richard at richardsylvester.com. That's R-I-C-H-A-R-D-S-Y-L-V-E-S-T-E-R dot -E -E com. Learn more and connect with Dawn at dawngarland.co.uk. That's Dawn, D-A-W-N, Garland, G-A-R-L-A-N-D dot C-O dot U-K. If you've enjoyed this podcast, 
Please subscribe so you have immediate access to future episodes. Please give us a five-star rating and share it with the people you care about. If you'd like to learn more about my work, my mentor, Wester Wevinson's work and the Sedona Method, please visit www.sedona.com. As you explore our site, you will learn the key to lasting happiness, success, peace, and emotional well-being. We have books, courses, events, and plenty of free material to explore. Again, go to sedona.com. That's S-E-D-O-N-A dot com. Thank you for being here, and we'll catch you in the next episode of Letting Go and the Greatest Secrets.